History. I'm not a historian. Andy's not a trained historian, but we both, you know, we're educated guys, and we both, I, I come from the humanities and the social sciences. What, Andy, what was your field again? Um, <laughs> I have a, a bachelor's degree in film hmm. and a master's degree in accountancy, so that makes me right on top of the history part. <laughs> <laughs> But somehow, you know, we, we do it. We're very, very careful about our hobby and really into it. And so, yeah, we call ourselves historians, kind of, <laughs> kind of. I want to give a brief lecture here, if I may, and uh, co-host, do you mind? What would there be to mind about a history lecture? Go for it. Oh, Andy, you won't hate me? Well, I, I won't know until I hear it. It's very long. Well, let's not get too personal here. No, no, my lecture. I mean, I think it'll be longer than you think. Look, I don't care how excrementally long it is. Let's get through this lecture of yours with all speed and finish this episode. Okay, here goes. Magna Carta. Magna Carta. Magna Carta. The Magna Carta. England. 1215. On the 15th of June, 1215, in the town of Runnymede. Magna Carta, was it a document signed at Runnymede in 1215? The two sides met at Runnymede in June 1215. King John of England. King John. Aye. The barons demanded that King John obey the law. Was it a document signed at Runnymede in 1215 by King John pledging independence to the English barons? Magna Carta was intended to create peace between King John and his rebellious barons. King John believes he is above the rule of law. Then we must have new rules. And on the 15th of June, 1215, at Runnymede near Windsor, the two sides meet. It was forced upon King John by a group of his own rebellious nobles, collectively called barons, who wanted to limit the immense power held by the king. What started out as a document of specific complaints from a group of barons has turned into an international symbol of liberty. Was it a document signed at Runnymede in 1215 by King John? Or was it a piece of chewing gum on a bedspread in Dorset? <laughs> Country dreamer. Country dreamer. Magna 
Carter, was it a document signed at running me in <laughs> Or was it a piece of chewing gum on a bedspread in Dawson? <laughs> the latter idea is the brainchild of a man new to the field of historical research. Mr. Badger, why, why are you on this program? Okay, here goes. People tend to think of small group biography similar to the way historians make sense of big history. Experts are able to point to causes that led to the drafting of the Magna Carta and its consequences in Britain and beyond. And it wasn't a piece of chewing gum. So that's big history. Clear causes clear consequences because there are so many people involved and it's such a big demographic and so many factors that things kind of even out little quirks and random things don't make a big difference in big history things are more explainable but small-scale history is way more complicated because you have multiple causes and consequences, misinformation, personal agendas creating multiple perspectives like Rashomon. There are random forks in the road, lucky here, unlucky there, hard work and goofing off, charm, strangeness and um, quirks. <laughs> Meanwhile, the social environment changes from the Kaiser Keller to Granada Television, from screaming girls to the beautiful people in the summer of love, from Bloody Sunday to Disney Plus. We all know there's no single factor to explain the Beatles' singular success. It's just impossible to explain in a nutshell. And then, of course, we find Beatle mythology, non-facts that never die, like John was born during an air raid, not true. They played 10,000 hours in Hamburg, not true. Stu couldn't even play and stood with his back to the audience, it's not true. For us humans, our big brains evolved such that we can conceptualize all sorts of crap really easily, you know? You can browse YouTube and find so many self-proclaimed experts on everything, and they'll share all sorts of knowledge they've compiled using their big human brains. Some of it well-founded, and a lot of it really off the wall. Let's just notice the interesting fact that ridiculous conspiracy theories and brilliant scientific theories both have in common the use of the big human brain. That is kind of interesting, isn't it? I mean, we all are one species, after all. Upright walking, opposable thumbs, big brains, that's us. That's our species. One of the hardest concepts for us to get our human brains around is that of evolution itself. 
the world around us, including everything, including ourselves, including the most famous musicians, all, everything in the current universe results from what? Everything results from past causes and effects, and it, in it includes culture. The Beatles and others whose works affected our culture are the ones who predominated, just as our DNA predominated. The fact that rock had evolved from gospel in America and influenced a bunch of rockers just when the oldest post-war baby boomers were coming of age, and that the boys who'd become the Beatles had the right talents, personalities, attitudes, comedic influences, rock influences, that they would find each other through mutual friends at a church fate in Walton or on the bus to school, that they gained so many hours performing covers in Hamburg and Merseyside that Brian sought them out, then signed to EMI, worked with Martin, that they'd break in America with perfect timing for the peak boomer ages. For, for each of those environments, each of those situations, they were the right thing for the situation, and the situations arrived just the right time for them. And so they're the ones that predominated, so they're the ones that we talk about. You know, but Americans laughed when first exposed to the Beatles uh, upon the release of She Loves You on the Swan label in mid-September 1963. She Loves You goes nowhere. It's a flop. That's interesting. The Beatles, for the first time, become a blip on the global news radar after they win over the royal family at the Palladium, and the mania in Britain starts verging on mayhem. At the same time, newspapers start warming to them as cute, <laughs> sort of. Notably, when they returned from playing in Sweden for the first time, the world noticed. From international arrivals to international news, suddenly they're viewed as a cultural phenomenon. This is all happening in that time when they're going no place in America and then five months later they're everywhere. They're not just viewed as a beat group, but as a cultural phenomenon. Ed Sullivan happened to be at the airport <laughs> just when they returned from Sweden and noticed the screaming girls and recognized it as uh, another Elvis phenomenon. That's an interesting coincidence. Most people know that, by the way. I know I'm not telling you anything new. <laughs> Meanwhile, back in the States, uh, VJ Records had nearly collapsed in scandal. Uh, legally, Capital regained the rights to sign the Beatles, but the boss still saw nothing in them and no potential. Jeez. Capital is uh, always doing the wrong thing in this story, but anyway. So, five months before the stateside mania, they're nowhere in America. They're still nothing. 
What happens to take the Beatles from nothing to everything in the USA in five months, five short months, is almost miraculous. The head of EMI intervened and pushed its capital division. And I think that this happened because in England, things were becoming very obvious that they were quite a phenomenon. And people started to recognize, of course, they're going to go over in the States. And Brian knew this. The head of EMI knew this now. And also Ed Sullivan happened to be in London and happened to notice it at the same time. It's all very interesting. Brian Epstein and Ed Sullivan negotiated together brilliantly. Both came away feeling like winners. A massive campaign was created at exactly the time when American news outlets happened to be looking for uplifting light content post-assassination. Coincidentally, they had unreleased footage and reporting that had been put on hold right at the time the president had been killed in November in 63. I'm going to put a link to this whole story. Uh, the story of how they broke in America is just amazing. And this is from Billboard. I'll put a link in the show notes. Each of these elements being essential but not sufficient combined to make these guys the best adapted to each of these cultural environments, enabling great productive success. I'm intentionally using the language of biological evolution. Um, they were adapted to the right environment, even as it changed, even as the 1960s changed. The early 60s, the Red Beatles were adapted to that. And then the Blue, the Blue Album Beatles in the late 1960s, they were adapted to the late 1960s as well. So you had Hold Me Tight in the early 60s, and you had the White Album in the late 1960s, and they were perfectly adapted to both by coincidence, you know? And it's a very good coincidence. I don't think there's any such thing as experimental methods in history. If it hadn't all happened just the right way, there's no scientific test for that. Maybe in a parallel universe that's exactly like ours, except that Paul decides not to go with Ivan to the fit, never sees the quarryman, marries Dot Roan because she doesn't miscarry, keeps his job at Massey and Coggins, and actually becomes good at winding coils, and uh, moves up in the company. And maybe, you know, as a hobby, he plays bass with some Liverpool group <laughs> on weekends or something. In our parallel universe, our parallel cousins live in a Beatles-less world that's like in that movie yesterday. In that universe, there would have been some other follow-up to the late 50s rock and the early 60s girl groups. There would have been something. Maybe there's Beach Boy Mania or Dave Clark Five Mania. Whatever rose to the top would have been what we would be talking about. I don't know that we would be talking about it half a century later, more than half a century later, the, the Beatles really were incredible and special, really were phenomenal. I, I don't, I don't want to say that they were random by any, by any means, but some recording artist would get to the top of the chart. Somebody's always number one, whoever it is, you know, but it wouldn't have been the Beatles in this universe. In our universe, it was the Beatles. You're good at wireless programs, aren't you? Yeah, well, we thought of doing the wireless, actually. We had thought of looking into the wireless, because there's a lot of possibilities, you know. So it's quite possible that we would do something, you know. Yeah. Because it's so much fun, as you, you yourself know, Ken, being on the other end of the microphone. Now, if you prefer religious rather than scientific explanations of a group's success, then maybe you thank the hand of God or destiny based on the Fab's own determination, charm, and pluck Maybe God saw their pluck and said, it is good. And he arranged it so all of those lucky steps would fall into place just right. 
God even put snooty little Tony Meehan at Decca deliberately to create failure because God liked George Martin better. <laughs> it's possible. He liked what George had done with Peter Sellers and Sophia Loren. Goodness gracious me. I don't know. But I think a good way to understand the Beatles is to think of them as us. They were lovers of Eddie Cochran, just like so many of us are lovers of Eddie Cochran. Or Little Richard, or Elvis, or Carl Perkins. And all of those rock pioneers were influenced by Rosetta Tharp. And she was brought to us by the merger of gospel and the newly invented electric guitar. The Beatles had a lot in common with hundreds of groups that preceded them and the thousands that followed them. Yes, they're very special, but in many ways they're very much the same. Many of us had groups, or still do. They loved and hated fame just as most other famous people love and hate being famous. They weren't the first humans to experiment with drugs. They went on meditation retreats just as people do. I am you as you are me, and we're all together. We respect them more, not by objectifying them, but by seeing them in their humanity. Last month, historian Rob Gertson sent his Facebook friends a link to a particularly enlightening article posted by Michael Gerber in his Hey Dull blog titled Moving Past Fandom. Have a look. We'll put a link in the show notes. The Beatles, most of all, wanted to be treated like people. This is something you heard them over and over again say. You know, I'm just a guy. I'm just, you know, we're just a band. And it makes sense. It makes complete sense to recognize their extraordinary gifts and their incredible story and still feel a perfectly normal I-thou connection with them, as you would with family or friends. This doesn't lower them, but rather respects them in their full humanity, rather than objectifying them as characters. Gerber doesn't bother to cite the source of the I-Thou connection concept, but here's a quick explanation. A 2019 article by Matthew Martin and Eric W. Cowan for the American Counseling Association explains what the philosopher of dialogue, Martin Buber, meant by an I-Thou relationship. And I'll quote, The I-Thou relationship is characterized by mutuality, directness, presentness, intensity, and ineffability, a state of experiencing coexistence that's beyond words. Buber described the meeting between I and thou as a bold leap into the experience of the other while simultaneously being transparent, present, and accessible. In their bubble of fame, the Beatles seemed drawn to the few people who would meet them this way. You know, think of the way that they connected with Kenny Everett, or the way that they connected with Larry Kane. Well, this is the end of the sermon. So there. <laughs> I don't mean to be a bore, but... Our Beatles 60 purpose is to gain insights into the Beatles' development, to understand the ways they evolved over time. We don't mean to tap into worship or reverence or bestness. That's all fine, but... The story itself is amazing, even if we don't treat them like superheroes. You were complaining about a year ago. Really? Yeah. <laughs> you were complaining that um, the equipment that you were using to make your records was all that 19th, 18th century. Yeah. Is it oh, still like that? Yeah. You know, I mean, EMI are just about to buy some eight track machines, you know. Woo! And that's. Any road, jumping ahead a few months in 1962. 
The Beatles were assigned to George Martin out of some very unrelated internal politics at EMI. He accepted them not knowing that they were the answer to his dreams. And the Beatles had no idea how incredibly perfectly matched they were. It's no wonder that Martin would later often retell Beatle George's cheeky, don't like your tie quip to illustrate early moments when there were hints that they were bound to make high quality product together, that they didn't even know at first what perfection the relationship had in store for them shows that factors beyond our will or our initial understanding can have tremendous consequences. And Zach's right, having another few months unsigned to any label wasn't such a bad delay since they used that time to write their first hits. It worked beautifully. Because it did, we're still talking about it in February 2022. In other words, things that succeed will last and we'll notice them in the future as we're doing now. Is he dead? Sit you down, father. When did you first realize that? Well, I was about seven, actually. Really? <laughs> I was at the back of the class, and the teacher said, Lennon, you're not attending. I couldn't even see him. What's the character of the other? What do There are going to be links to everything we talked about in our show notes that you can check out. So please do. the silliest person we've ever had on this program. <laughs> and so I'm going to ask you to have dinner with me. We're in 97 megahertz in stereo. And now, a message from our sponsor. This is Brian, or Epi, as the boys are fond of calling me. And I hope you've enjoyed today's episode of Beatles 60. The Beatles, at their heart, are storytellers. And I'd like to invite you to go even deeper into their story by listening to another program called A Day in Their Life, an audio drama of the Beatles' story. Both Andy and Lawrence agree, it's simply marvellous. 
For details, visit Beatledrama.com or see the show notes for this Beatles 60 episode for the link. Thank you. Thank you. Here's our number again, 0612286262, and it's contest time. <laughs> 